everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Danica. Um, I'm a national organizer with Code Pink. Um, and this webinar is part of our new campaign call to disarm, uh, where we are challenging the US arms trade. Um, so this webinar is going to be called Uncovering the Arms Trade, the Arms Sales We Don't Hear About. And I'm so honored to have the guest Lillian Malden here with us. Lillian's a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, holding a BA in Honors International Relations and Global Studies with a minor in Arabic. She is a founding member of a member of Women for Weapons Trade Transparency and a thematic specialist with Amnesty International's USA Military Security and Police Transfers Coordination Group. She was a summer 2021 participant in the US Department of State Critical Language Scholarship and a summer 2021 policy intern at Forum on the Arms Trade. Uh, Lillian hopes to continue her career in the arms control and nonproliferation field, ideally uh, lobbying for decreased defense budgets and more rigorous arms export control laws. And with that, I will pass it over to Lillian. And if you have any questions throughout the event, please put it in the Q&A section um, so I don't miss it in the chat if, if people start talking a lot. So please put it in the Q&A section and we will answer questions after. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Lillian. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be with Code Pink today um, for a really important conversation about US arms sales that fall under congressional and public notification dollar thresholds, um, which is quite the mouthful. And you know, we will get into what that means exactly here in just a second. Um, so these under threshold sales pose a really grave threat to transparency within the US arms trade. Um, and even more importantly, to the livelihoods of so many people around the globe. Um, and I also want to mention um, just briefly that Jeff Abramson got more into the details of U.S. arms sales policy in a previous webinar with Code Pink. Um, so I would definitely encourage you all to check that out as well after this webinar concludes. Um, but yeah, so for some background on the issue of under notification threshold sales. Um, so the scale of US, the US arms trade is enormous, as I'm sure a lot of you know already. Um, between 2002 and 2018, the United States sold over $200 billion in major, major conventional weapons to 169 different countries. Um, and so arms and weapons sales by the US to international governments require a lot of different policies and processes for their approval. Um, and this is from everything from broad strategies um, that lay out kind of overarching purposes of arms sales to really specific policies that kind of govern the minutia of transfers. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I have a couple of slides here. Sorry if I can. Um, logistics, okay, great. So, um, there are two main avenues um, through which arms can be transferred from the US government to other countries. Um, and so these are foreign military sales and direct commercial sales or FMS and DCS. Um, and so here you can see a diagram of the different processes of approval for FMS and DCS. Um, and FMS is facilitated by the Defense Security Cooperate, Co Cooperation Agency um, or DSCA, um, which they also release public records of sales on their major arms sales page. Um, this is you know, a public website and can be, can be accessed um, by all of you. Um, and so DCS is the process through which defense contractors and weapons manufacturers make their profits. Um, and so through DCS, the Directorate of Tra Defense Trade Controls or DDTC approves sales between international governments um, and these weapons manufacturers. So then DDTC releases data about these sales on their website um, through an annual publication called the 655 report. Um, and you can see that here at the bottom of the slide. Um, and this is again, public information. If you go to the DDTC website, go to the report section, you can see that 2020 um, report. Of course, the, the 2021 yet, it's one is not yet out. Um, so the question you might be asking is you know what are the what are the problems of transparency with U.S. arms sales um, if all this information is on you know these two websites? So um, if we revisit the flowcharts for FMS and DCS approvals um, again, and then we look um, at the Congress section that are that are circled here, you can see that a section of the AECA, uh, which is the Arms Export Control Act, is cited. Um, and so this is because under Section 36B of the Arms Export Control Act, 
um, Congress has to be formally notified 30 calendar days um, before a presidential administration can conclude um, a foreign military sale of major defense equipment valued at $14 million or more, um, defense articles or services valued at $50 million or more, or design and construction services valued at $200 million or more. And so those are a lot of different kind of thresholds there, but it really just depends on kind of what um, category this, these pieces of equipment are falling under. Um, and then as for direct commercial sales, which is this you know, green um, flow chart at the top, um, under 36C, section 36C of the AECA, they also must be formally notified to Congress 30 calendar days before the export license is issued for the sale of major defense equipment valued at $14 million or more. And again, defense articles and services valued at $50 million or more. So it's the same requirements as FMS, but just under a different, different section of the AECA. Um, and similarly, there are also higher dollar thresholds and shorter waiting periods for NATO countries, um, as well as for Japan, Australia, South Korea, Israel, and New Zealand. Um, and so here's kind of a partial table of some of these notification thresholds that I'm describing. And you might be able to infer um, from these, you know, these sections of the AECA why there's an issue of transparency here within the US arms trade, um, because if the dollar if a sale is below one of these thresholds, or you know, it's, uh, especially for these NATO countries that you know, there's not as much time, um, Congress doesn't have to be formally notified. And so information on sales doesn't have to be made public either. And so this is just a really serious problem for transparency and public knowledge of US arms sales abroad um, as many sales of uh, defense articles and defense equipment aren't reported to Congress um, to civil society or the general public. Um, and then uh, if y'all could just put the link to the piece, um, I authored a piece on this issue uh, with Center for International Policy um, that kind of goes more into depth. Um, so yeah, we don't know much at all about these under threshold sales, um, but we do kind of have a small window of insight into this really big problem. Um, and so in August, 2020, the Office of the Inspector General for the Department of State issued a report um, regarding the Secretary of State's May 2019 certification of emergency under the Arms Export Control Act. Um, and the report found that the department approved a total of 4,221 below threshold arms transfers um, involving Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates with an estimated total value of $11.2 billion since January 2017. Um, and so in, this is, you know, some of the screenshots of that report. Um, you can see underlined here some of those really significant findings from the OIG. Um, and so we can also infer that a lot of under threshold sales um, maybe direct commercial sales as opposed to foreign military sales. Um, it's a lot more difficult to get equipment through the foreign military sales process. So if a government is going to kind of go through the trouble of the FMS process, they um, will generally kind of be, you know, hitting that dollar notification threshold with those, those larger purchases. Um, and then lastly, kind of the last problem, I guess I want to flag is um, there was also a rollback of transparency under the Trump administration, when uh, categories one through three of the US munitions list were transferred to the commerce control list. So what this means is that a lot of firearms, um, including semi-automatic assault weapons that are being exported um, internationally no longer require congressional notification. Um, and so we're gonna share again, two links in the chat um, to do two different resource pages from Forum on the Arms Trade. Um, which I, again, I interned with over the summer. And so one of them is on this uh, US munitions list um, categories one through three that have been transferred. And then the other one um, is a resource page on under threshold sales uh, more broadly. But so kind of with this, um, these multiple problems presented here, I just wanted to flag efforts that are currently underway um, to access data on arms sales falling under congressional, not congressional notification thresholds. Um, and so, you know, my own organization, um, as well as some very experienced individuals in the field of arms trade research, uh, we recently filed Freedom of Information Act requests or FOIA requests 
um, with the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, which um, manages those, those FMS purchases. Um, and so we asked for letters of authorization for sales falling under these dollar thresholds and we're you know, awaiting our, our request to be fulfilled through that process. Um, and so lastly, um, and then I think we can open it up for questions. Um, I just wanna emphasize how important public scrutiny of, of government actions is. Um, to a you know a healthy and, and thriving democracy, and I, I want to point out that you know the size of a weapon sale doesn't always correlate with the risk of the harm that it could potentially cause, um, because some of the most easily transferred weapons um, are also also the most easily diverted and misused um, uh, for for harm, and um, it's it's really important for Congress to be notified of all U.S. arms sales. Um, in order to provide a starting point for reform of the legislative um, arms sales review process, because we can't you know, prevent unnecessary um, death and destruction as a result of arms sales if we don't have kind of a complete picture of what is being exported and being able to track that. So um, I will stop talking there and yeah, happy to take questions. <laughs> yeah, please uh, put any questions in the Q&A section. I'll, I'll look out in the chat too. Um, Fahim has a question, is the 14 million per PO or per year uh, purchase order to a foreign agency or per year to any and all agencies of a foreign country? So I th if I understand correctly, um, I think Fahim's referring to that that threshold of 14 million. I believe it's it's the value of the the one sale um, per purchase order. Um, yeah, it's it's. I believe it's you know per order of um, sales. I don't think it's an aggregate. Um, if I'm understanding that question correctly, Nick said it would be the value of the authorization, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thank you. You said that, um, you know, it's not always like the big F-35 sales. It's not always like um, the JDAM sales that get reported that are like the most harmful in practice, like when they're actually used. Um, do you have any examples of like smaller weapon sales that we've heard of or that weapons we know are being used that would be considered under the threshold anywhere? Like any like specific examples, just to give people kind of an idea of what the issue with that transparency is, even though they're technically smaller sales. Right. Yeah. Um, typically, you know, the smaller sales, like small arms and light weapons, for example, those that are um, have been transferred from that U.S. munition list categories one through three to the commerce control list now um, are some of the ones that are typically the most misused and diverted and getting into um, hands that they were not intended to be in. Um, and so this is kind of another issue with in-use monitoring as well um, and kind of lack of really stringent reporting mechanisms for those arms. Um, because if you think about it, you know, it's going to be a lot easier um, to, for some, someone to steal, you know, a, um, a semi-automatic rifle than it would be for them to steal an F-35, um, just logistically speaking. So, um, you know, we've seen, you know, and for example, there's a lawsuit um, from Mexico against several U.S. arms manufacturers right now um, regarding the proliferation of small arms and light weapons um, in Mexico. And so, you know, you kind of see these cases again and again with capture uh, of small arms and light weapons, especially by, um, you know, individuals and groups that the United States has designated as terrorist organizations. You know, we've seen that. Um, we've seen those weapons used against United States allies as well. Um, so there are just, you know, several, several examples through history that um, kind of demonstrate that that really grave risk. Um, <clears throat> I want to bring something out from that, but also I want to circle back to end use monitoring. So don't let me forget, but um, there's Mexico suing the weapons manufacturers. Correct. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find um, a link. Okay. About this lawsuit. Because <clears throat> we were talking before this webinar started, like how, how are, weapons companies like culpable in these sorts of situations? Like what is their responsibility? So I'm just, 
I'm I'm interested in how the government of Mexico is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, apparently it's against 10 different gun manufacturers um, and the, the case is being heard in the U.S. federal court. Um, let me see. Yeah, so Center for American Progress has, um, I think, a resource page with looks like a lot of links um, that might be helpful that I'll put in the chat. Um, so yeah, we, yes, that was in, uh, yeah, in September, so quite recently. Um, I see another question in the chat. Regulatory environment for weapons companies. Um, in terms of, I also see a question from Ari. Um, hi, Ari. Uh, <laughs> what is, okay, the regulatory environment for weapons companies. Um, I, I'm honestly not familiar with, you know, if, if you're speaking in terms of kind of production and um, regulation of uh, assembly and, and production of those weapons, I'm not super familiar with that. Um, I am more familiar with the government regulation side um, and kind of the governance process uh, for the export of those weapons. So kind of after the fact of the, the weapons manufacturers. Um, I, I would assume it's not super rigorously regulated, just, just it might be a safe assumption, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Ari says, not a question, but it might be worth bringing up that a lot of the security training we pay for is used in human rights abuses, defense articles and services. Yeah, definitely. Um, absolutely. We've seen um, that happen a lot. Um, in a lot of just various places, definitely security training being used um, for kind of authoritarian insulation um, and, and protection of, uh, of authoritarian regimes um, that we, you know, are aiding there. Um, to circle back really quickly to end use monitoring, just because I think it's another transparency issue. <clears throat> so the AECA mandates end use reporting, right? I think it's like the State Department has to do end use monitoring, which for people who don't know is basically kind of a report back on what our weapons are used for and kind of by whom. Um, and one issue I think with end use monitoring and like the way they do it is let's say Saudi Arabia buys weapons from the US and they say it's for their army. It's for the Saudi army or the Saudi military. There's so many different units within the military and we don't often get those specifics during end use monitoring of like where those weapons actually end up. So for like organizations like Code Pink and other um, <clears throat> peace or anti-war organizations, it's hard to like follow the war crimes that are being committed with like weapons manufactured in the United States. Um, like who used them? How did they get them? That kind of thing. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Lillian. Yeah, definitely. Um, in use monitoring is kind of notoriously insufficient um, and something that recently um, I, I was joining efforts on with um, several other um, NGOs um, and conflict prevention organizations is there's a form called the DSP 83. Um, and that is a form that asks questions about kind of, you know, where defense articles and services are being transferred. And, um, and so we, you know, input public comment uh, on the federal register um, for that form, basically, you know, saying that, it still needs to be used, um, but it needs to be made more robust and there needs to be um, you know, more, more questions asked about what things are being used for and not just where they're ending up um, because that is um, a big problem is a, a lot of in-use monitoring is just kind of um, where are things location wise and it, they don't monitor their actual use. Um, so it's, it's kind of not so much in-use monitoring as it is in, location monitoring. Um, and so that's that's a problem that um, I've seen some mobilization going on 
um, recently. And I know Ari um, from, uh, from Civic and um, Security Assistance Monitor just put out like a really great like three pager on in use monitoring and the problems around that. Um, and I'm going to see if I can find that and put the link in the chat because it's just really helpful um, and, and helped me a lot. So I highly recommend anyone here if you're interested in like following arms sales and like arms legislation. Uh, Security Assistance Monitor has like a weekly new newsletter and it is so good. Like it gives you so much information. I like really, really suggest subscribing to the to the newsletter, um, just for the information that they, that they send out every week. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat from Jennifer. Um, would lawsuits against the weapons manufacturers be more effective than the US government? Consider the lawsuits against the tobacco companies. That's interesting, I didn't think of that. I, I don't know. Honestly, <laughs> I don't have expertise to answer that question. Um, that's a great point. Um, Might be a shorter <laughs> case with maybe a settlement, um, yeah. but I don't know. That's something to think about. I mean, I, I suggest following the case with Mexico. I think that'll give an answer because I don't know if anything like this has been done with, before with weapons manufacturers, to be honest. It's kind of big. Um, Nick's asking, are you worried at all about congressional members being influenced by domestic defense industry and the economic benefits it brings to the country, especially as domestic defense industry is being pressured by international competition? I, yes, I am very worried and it has been happening for decades. Um, you know, politicians, of course, accept so much money from uh, defense contractors, so-called defense contractors. I like to call them weapons manufacturers. Um, and you know, we, we also see a lot of lobbying from these weapons manufacturers regarding job creation that has kind of, especially with Lockheed Martin, that's kind of been historically um, the angle that they take to influence uh, members of Congress is, you know, we have created X number of jobs in your district and, you know, voting against this proposal is, is going to, you know, get rid of these, these jobs. Um, and when you actually kind of break down and look at the statistics, um, really any other form of governmental spending, uh, I'm citing William Hartung here, will create more jobs um, than, than defense spending. Um, and so that is kind of one of their, their marketing tactics. Um, that I think is very interesting and nefarious. Um, this is a great place to plug. Codefing's new campaign is called Call to Disarm. And we're, one thing we're doing is we're going to like local constituencies and pressuring members, specific members of Congress to stop taking money from weapons companies. Um, Code Pink has a pledge um, and I will put the link to the action in the chat but please go to this link. It'll give you a form to fill out and it'll automatically send the um, pledge to your, um, peop uh, your people in Congress asking them to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons companies. Because this is a huge issue I ran into when I started working on arms trade issues at Code Pink was that, okay, there's transparency issues. There's issues where we don't have a lot of time to respond bond when uh, the ones that are reported are reported to Congress. It's like either 15 or 30 days. It's not a lot of time to like get the grassroots going on the, on these issues. So it's like, obviously some legislation needs to change, but how are we gonna pass legislation when all of these pockets in Congress are lined by Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, General Dynamics. They take so much money from weapons companies. Um, so that's something our campaign is trying to do is get more members of Congress. And we have before gotten members of Congress to start refusing money from these companies. So they no longer have, they're accountable to us. That's what it's supposed to be. They're not accountable to Raytheon or Lockheed Martin and they shouldn't be. Um, so that's something we're doing. If that's interesting to you, I will put the link to the campaign's whole thing in the in the chat in a couple minutes. But <clears throat> you should call your rep, be like, "Hey, stop it! <laughs> stop taking money from weapons companies." But <clears throat> that is that's a huge concern, and it makes arms uh, control uh, legislation hard to pass in Congress, harder than it would be otherwise. <laughs> We have another to scroll up to find it. Um, another really coming in. Um, is it 
possible that there's a willful ignorance about what happens to certain as you put under threshold weapons once they're shipped to an approved purchaser? Is that uh, an aspect you're investigating? What happens once they're shipped to an approved purchaser? That sounds kind of like it's regarding end use monitoring um, yeah. once they're shipped to an approved purchaser. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it, it, like I mentioned, end use monitoring is, is notoriously insufficient. Um, and um, I, I, I definitely think that it might be, you know, somewhat willful on, on the parts of um, the United States government and people that we are exporting to, um, you know, I, the United States knows it's complicit in um, a lot of grave abuses of uh, human rights. And um, I don't think it's an accident that we're, you know, not actively pursuing a stop to that um, before it starts, so. Um. Pai's asking, do you know of any members of Congress who are slash might be supportive of weapons sale reform or bills regarding weapon sales? So another thing that we, the, the group that, you know, we filed the, these FOIA requests, um, we're, we're also trying to kind of work some congressional uh, contacts. And uh, I believe Rashida Tlaib's office um, was interested in, in further transparency of the arms trade. And that is an office that we, I believe, have reached out to. Um, we kind of have like two different groups of us, kind of one working on the FOIA side and one working on the Congress side. Um, so I was kind of working on the FOIA side. So I'm not super um, familiar with the, the intricacies of all those contacts there. But um, I believe that there are a couple of people, including uh, Congresswoman Tlaib's office. Cool. And yeah, there's <clears throat> there have been um, uh, bills introduced in Congress that would. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at like the co-sponsors there would give you an answer. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any comment? on the recent legislation to lower the congressional notification value thresholds, step in the right direction or just window dressing? If I, so I'm assuming this is referring to uh, Senator Menendez's Safeguard Act. If that is the legislation that you're referring to, I know that um, that was you know attempting to amend the Arms Export Control Act to completely get rid of notification thresholds um, for certain um, certain customers who it was like, you know, if there was, if the government was deposed by a coup, um, uh, if there were, you know, proven grave abuses of human rights, things of that sort, um, then it was going to completely get rid of uh, notification thresholds for certain, certain purchasers. Um, I am kind of on the side of any little bit we can get. Um, I'll, I'll try to kind of um, be in favor of that, but you know, I definitely think that there, there's so much more that can be done and it's just a matter of gridlock um, and what is realistically going to be able to be passed. Um, you know, and I know some people are on the side of, um, you know, not supporting things unless it is, you know, a complete, um, complete kind of overhaul and complete reform. Um, and I definitely respect that approach as well. Um, I think it, it's just kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're fighting a centuries old uh, system that has been broken from the beginning. Um, so I think it's, you know, we're kind of in it for the long haul. Jennifer's asking, are there competing interests based on stock ownership by congressional members? Competing interests based on stock ownership? That I am not super familiar with. Um, I, you know, I've heard things in regard to um, congressional stock ownership, and I'm not super familiar with the intricacies of uh, what's going on there, but um, I, I would assume that there are some um, some competing interests there and some conflicts of interest um, regarding money that uh, Congress people would like to hold on to. 
Um, Marcy's asking how imminent or assured is a commerce department takeover of most arm sales? Whew, that's scary. Um, I guess, should we, it, so, um, I don't, right now, uh, a lot of arm sales uh, go through the State Department, um, which has like laws about transparency like they have to you know if they when they have to report to congress that kind of thing um some sales go through the commerce department um and jeff abramson was talking about this on the webinar um i had a couple weeks ago i highly recommend checking out um it's on our um code pinks youtube uh it's called weapon sale 101 but um there's kind of been a move to move more arm sales over to the commerce department just to kind of give people a preface for that question. Um, but I don't know, Lillian, if you want to talk about why that might be concerning or how imminent that is. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any insight on, um, on the movement of more arms sales to the Commerce Department. You know, I, as I mentioned, I know categories one through three of the US munitions list were moved. Um, and I believe it was a Biden campaign promise to revert that Trump era policy back to the US munitions list. Um, and that not has not yet been done. Um, so I am not going to uh, attempt to make any predictions. I don't have enough insight into the inner workings right now. Um, I, you know, I certainly hope that that does not happen. Yeah, it's definitely concerning. Um, <clears throat> I think the arms trade has in the US and globally has a um, instinct to move to whatever road leads to less transparency. Um, so that's something to be concerned about. But, <clears throat> you know, it's something that we need to make a bit of a ruckus about because the less transparency we have, the less we can do about it. Um, it's, you know, the peace movement doesn't, can't even react to arm sales that we don't hear about, like the ones under congressional reporting thresholds. Um, so the more transparency, the better. It's, it's good to resist that move to the Commerce Department, I'd say, um, and push for more transparency on the State Department side of it. Um, we don't have any live questions, but Lillian, do you want to talk a little bit about your organization and like what you guys have done in the past, what you have plans to do? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I would love to. So yeah, Women for Open Straight Transparency have been in operation for uh, since July 2020. So a year and a few months. Um, we have a divestment campaign um, regarding the University of Texas, Texas A&M Investment Management Companies, investments in weapons manufacturers, um, another mouthful, as many things in this field are. Um, so that's is UT Austin, the, the entire UT system, all of those universities, it's their asset manager, and they manage a $60 billion portfolio. And of that portfolio, about $52.5 million um, from our own analysis is, uh, is invested in weapons manufacturers. Um, and so we've been, you know, communicating with the UTEMCO board of directors, meeting with them, with the board of regents, um, getting faculty support, student support, passing legislation through student governance bodies. It's been quite the process um, and we're just, you know, kind of continuing to be persistent and annoy administration about this. Um, and so that's kind of our initial campaign. We're also doing some work on police militarization um, through the 1122 program, which um, some of you might have heard of the 1033 program. 1122 is, is a bit smaller and it's different um, in that um, police departments have to purchase the equipment uh, and 1033 is just accessed for free. Um, and so we have recently just obtained federal uh, FOIA records on the 1122 program. We're currently um, writing a report. We're about to do data analysis on that. And so that report will be coming out in the next um, couple of months. So definitely watch out for that. Um, you know, definitely looking to, to generate more public knowledge of this and then work um, on the advocacy side, hopefully trying to, you know, work with some congressional partners, maybe to get legislation to um, get the 1122 program abolished. Um, and then, you know, finally, we're, we are working on the um, arms sales under notification thresholds through the FOIA process as well. Um, so we have, you know, about three 
large scale projects kind of going on at the same time. Um, yeah, and we're we're pretty small, um, but we're we're plugging along. Where can people follow you guys? Yes, um, so I will put our website. It's just w two t two dot org, um, and there we have all our social medias like linked on the top right hand corner. Um, I also see a question. Let's see from Fahim. Can you talk about if anything has been done to date by the students and faculty, and citizens in Austin regarding the headquarters of U.S. Army Futures Command right in the rural campus? I heard I haven't heard anything to date. Yeah, um, I personally have not heard of anything either. Any advocacy and mobilization? That's not to say it doesn't exist. Um, I just have not seen it. Um, I you know I think that's extremely concerning. And um, I think I've seen kind of some, you know, individual opposition on social media, um, women for weapons trade transparency ourselves, whenever it was unveiled that they were doing like a robotics lab, we put out like a statement, you know, trying to um, kind of let people know that that was going on and, and opposing it. Um, and it's, it's especially concerning considering that um, they are developing robotics technology, um, which, you know, may include um, AI facial recognition technology, which is notoriously problematic and, and very dangerous. Um, thinking of the campaign to stop killer robots. Um, so, you know, thinking that, you know, that kind of technology development is going on at, at my alma mater is uh, very concerning. Um, and I, you know, I would personally be really interested in getting involved with, with anyone um, with a campaign to kind of oppose that. So if anyone knows anything about that, um, feel free to drop it in the chat. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Nick. Uh, have you seen any shift by industry from preferring FMS to direct commercial sales or the other way around? Yeah, so there has been a shift to industry kind of preferring DCS um, from my understanding. And there, especially with, um, I don't, gosh, I don't remember what uh, specific infrastructure or defense articles and services it was, but I do believe that there has kind of been a shift in recent years to DCS. Um, and it is a bit of an easier process to go through than FMS. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, so we kind of are assuming that a lot of under threshold stuff is going through DCS. Um, because there are, regulated? sorry, is DCS less regulated? Generally speaking, there's right. Yeah. Let me share, um, that flow chart again, if I can find it. Yeah. So there's like an extra step, um, So, right, so FMS, there's a country team assessment here with the US Embassy mm. that may have something to do with it. Um, if anyone has insight into like additional ways that DCS is a bit less regulated, please feel free to drop in the chat. Um, but I, I know that <laughs> it is kind of notoriously less regulated. I don't have a lot of um, wonky insights into specifically why, but yes. Cool, thank you. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, Pi says she went to UT Austin, can try to look more into that. So maybe we could circle back to that. Um, uh, Ari says, I think the biggest FMS DCS difference is FMS is US acquiring foreign sales for its security partners. So the US government has to perceive uh, on interest for itself. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. A lot of answers in the chat if anyone wants to read it. But um, all right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I guess we can wrap up. I learned so much and I want to thank Lillian for being with us today. 
And please go follow uh, Women for Weapons Trade Transparency. I always get so screwed up saying that. I don't know why. My, my mouth will not let me say your org name. <laughs> but um, please, please follow them. They're great. Um, and we'll have more webinars planned soon. Um, please go to codepink.org forward slash call to disarm and sign up for campaign updates there. Um, I'll be having more events like these and please go uh, back on Code Pink's YouTube and watch um, Weapon Sales 101 with Jeff Abramson. Um, if you were confused by any of the terms tonight, he does break it down, absolutely. Um, so it's really, really great. I really recommend uh, checking that out. Um, but Lillian, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you everyone who tuned in. Um, and I will see you all next time and have a great rest of your Thursday night. Thank you all so much. And thank you for your questions.